Today I can finally reveal the 83 page document, which was uh, the conclusion and actually the entire story is, was visioned by the arbitrator. The first thing we should look at is page number 19 and you can see in the document that the arbitrator find Mr. Watson not to be genuine and you can read the entire paragraph and say how Mr. Watson was not really uh, honest, he was evasive and in contradiction to him Mr. Gill's testimony appeared to be genuine and in some were fuzzy in detail and perhaps colored in hindsight by strong emotion of betrayal on the part of those in whom he had placed a perhaps naive degree of trust. Now why would I actually do that? It's because I'm used to honest people and as a matter of fact I don't recall actually meeting uh, crooks before and I don't know who they are and how to actually detect them. Now the, one of the most credible uh, people that she found was Mr. Swift. Mr. Swift, Chuck Swift, was the captain of the Bob Barker. Mr. Swift was highly credible in his testimony about matters he directly observed and that were within his area of knowledge and competence. She said that he was at some point almost to tears because he really regretted his decision to scuttle the other girl and I saw him. He was looking into my eyes and he was really, really, really sorry and he had tears in his eyes. Uh, then there was another person that C. Shepherd brought as a witness. His name is Matthew Kimora and he said that the toe of the other girl was successful. So C. Shepherd though with a small group of people uh, and at that point was Paul Watson, Chuck Swift, Luke Van Horn, and Pete Bethune kept all of that in secret and lied to the rest of the Sea Shepherd crew. They did not know, the rest of the crew, what the guys were doing. Mr. Swift describes a first genuine offer to tow, which was working, following by a photo attempt after the scuttling that was designed to fail. He explained, I wanted to save the vessel and it was my intention to try to save that vessel. Similar to Mr. Kimura, Mr. Swift describes an initial tow of at least several hours that was successful with the other girl not sinking as it was towed. Swift's recollection was that only after several hours of successful and genuine effort to tow did the line break for the first time and it was reattached to resume the tow at a slower rate which put less stress on the rope. From that point on, he testified, the tow line did not snap again until after the sea valves or you've heard a different terminology, the sea cocks on the other gear were deliberately open in order to scuttle it. The consistent recollection of all witnesses, I'm going to repeat, all witnesses, was that as long as the Adigil was sitting fairly high in the water, the toe appeared to be working. So in order for the toe not to work, something needed to happen. And what needed to happen was to get water into the boat itself to make it heavy. So Mr. Bethune explained why they went along with the instructions. Keep in mind, and that is a quote, keep in mind, at this stage, I'm there as a Sea Shepherd person. I'm a Sea Shepherd volunteer, and I have signed an agreement to say that I will follow orders. At this time, I consider I'm a Sea Shepherd person. My boss has given me instruction to sink the boat, and that's what I did. And in hindsight, I made a bad call. Mr. Batoon's story of the alleged scuttling has been largely consistent since he first articulated it in October of 2010. In October 2010, Pete sent me an email and said, Adi, I have to admit to you what I did, and I scuttled your boat, and it was Paul Watson's order. 
Chuck Swift then explains uh, what happened exactly. And he said, I was trying to respectfully because I worked for him. Again, going back to, to we were like brothers for a long time, Paul and Chuck Swift. But we were yelling. And I was saying, this is an organization asset. We can recover it. We are recovering. We have a plan. We have already lost the Japanese fleet. Which, if you lose the Japanese fleet, you do have the time to continue with the tow. And that's what he was telling Paul. Our mission is to try to save the whales. But saving this organizational asset might help us save the whales. If Sea Shepherd kept that boat, it could have potentially helped them with their mission to save whales. And over, and this is really important, over a 12 or 24, 36 hour period, I was getting calls on the bridge. And that was the entire time that that boat was under tow and everything that happened was around 36 hours. I was getting call on the phone. I was getting call on the radio from Paul. And I also from his first mate, Lockie, Lockheed Malcolm, and from the helicopter pilot, Chris Oldman. And I was being told, play the game. How come you are not following Paul's order? You need to get on with the program and do what needs to be done. And after however many times and after all of those hours without sleep and out of respect for Paul, because remember, I am a captain and he's the admiral. Did you guys see the picture from Paris? Admiral. I still love and respect him. He's done a lot of good things, which I would probably agree in his old days. I've seen some pictures of him on Zodiacs during his time with uh, Greenpeace with Michael Bailey. So I followed his order and I did what I did. Then he continues and say, I finally just kind of like threw my hands up and said, okay, as I was getting into the small boat with Luke and Pete to go and scuttle the other gill, I was still getting calls with, and I had the crew yelling out the bridge, Paul is still on the phone. He's all angry and he wants to talk to you. I said, tell him I'm doing it. Tell him it's going to happen right now and just leave me the fuck alone. And I went and I did it. So everybody is telling the same exact story as the arbitrator is saying, except of Paul Watson. Paul Watson has a different story, but actually Paul Watson did not have one different story. But Paul Watson had many different stories. It depends when the story, whether it was written, whether it was Facebook, whether it was talking to somebody, there were a variety of stories about this thing and it was completely inconsistent, one story to another. And she said, by contrast, Paul Watson's position on this issue has shifted numerous times. She noticed that he shifted. In his own deposition, he denied being aware of any point in time the seacocks of the Adigil had been opened. He, under oath, in a deposition, is unaware that he asked Chuck Swift to open the seacocks. Maybe he doesn't even know what seacocks are. He invoked, invoked the whale war video segment in which he was recorded as telling Mr. Swift that the decision what to do with the Adi Gill was entirely Mr. Bethune's to make. It's Pete's boat, it's Pete's decision. Mr. Watson's claim that this segment was recorded prior to the decision to abandon the vessel and not taped after the fact as other claimed. Discuss further below. What happened is they needed that segment for whale war, but they didn't have it because the discussion never happened because Pete Bethune never took the position to make a decision. It was Paul Watson. So now for whale war in the audience, you need a segment. So what do you do for television? It's really very simple. You just go and you record it and you see and you just plug it where you need it in the show. And you, the audience, believe that this is a reality, but it, it happened two days later. 
Anybody can go and shift segments in video and put them wherever they want to. And this is what we're work is all about, is you can take pieces and put them wherever you want to do. And they are under no obligation to tell the truth. Hey, this is Chuck on the Barker. I need to speak to Paul, please. Staring out the, the comms office window at the Audi Gill, it's taking on the water and it's sitting noticeably lower. And I'm guessing that within a couple hours it's going to be down. I'm thinking at this point we cut this thing loose and let it sink. Then we go to try to catch the fleet. How do you feel about that? Oh, I don't know. It's really Pete's call. It's really Pete's call. It's really Pete's call. Okay. Well, I would leave it up. Why were this all thing revealed? Uh, one thing was. Pete was writing a book and C. Shepard said they would help him publish the book and they never did so it really got him all upset and he said he's going to come out with the truth. There was another thing, C. Shepard owed Pete Petun $500,000. They didn't owe him $500,000 for his work or anything like it. In the original deal, I paid Pete Petun $1 million and C. Shepard said that they will pay him half a million dollar a year later. And they never did. And that half a million was for the original purchase of the Adi Gill, and that money was supposed to go to Pete Petun. And since they didn't, Pete Petun took them to court, won the court case, and they paid him half a million dollar. So then Pete knew that he was owed half a million dollars and he, won, he was playing a little bit with that half a million. He said he would put uh, Paul Watson with a lie detector and ask him five questions. And if Paul Watson can get, can pass the lie detector on five questions, each one is worth a hundred grand. So with five good questions and good answer, truthful answer, C. Shepard would have said half a million dollars. But Paul was a little nervous about that. So, but what he said, I would be delighted to take such a test in return for half a million dollar. And then here's what he writes. He just forget that he wrote this thing. In fact, the question of did I ask Chuck and Pete to scuttle the Adi Gill, the answer is yes, I did. There was no other choice. The ship was un salvageable and it was sinking slowly and was navigational hazard which floated so we assigned the sinking notified Australian maritime safety that we did it no big conspiracy here Chuck Swift is also talking about this half a million dollar and the uh, lie detector and he say Paul was freaking out at some point Pete offered to forfeit his half a million dollar if Paul wrote would undergo a lie detector test and Paul was kind of like terrified. So I asked him to let me think about something. And I spent five to six hours pacing back and forth in my apartment and formulated C. Shepard's public response, which was that we needed to sink the boat because it was a hazard, it was floating around. Mr. Batoon testified we made the decision to remove the GPS transponder because we were worried that if anyone found that the vessel and saw that the seacocks were open, they would realize we deliberately scuttled the vessel and that would make things very difficult for myself and Sea Shepherd. The arbitrator concluded from the evidence and particularly from the credible testimony of Chuck Swift that Mr. Watson did order the scuttling of Adi Gill. Sea Shepherd CEO Steve Bruce reminded the crew from shore that before leaving the Adi Gill to sink, get pictures, video of it going down. Gold for media. The Bob Barker crew was careful to do a slow circle around the vessel to film it. It was so that we could get the video and pictures out to the media. This were going to be the last images of the Adi Gill. The arbitrator concludes 
that this desire to maximize media attention ultimately led to the decision both to abandon toe effort and actively scuttle the other heel. It is abundantly clear that respondents nonetheless prioritize their self interest over their duties to Mr. Gill, and as a result, treated Mr. Gill the same way they treated the whale war audience. You guys, if you watch the show, namely, as someone not entitled to the full truth and certainly not entitled to meaningful real-time consultation.